Hello, everybody. Welcome to our transatlantic webinar, Latin America Towards a New Social Contract. The date is July 1st, but the time of day, well, that is going to be quite different for many of us joining. One of the positive things about these online events is that these discussions on international affairs can have truly international audiences. And we welcome those of you tuning in from Europe, those in Latin America, here in the United States, I'm in Washington, DC, and certainly beyond. Uh, my name is Samuel George. I'm the Global Markets and Digital Advisor for the Bertelsmann Foundation, and I'll be moderating uh, this conversation today. And we welcome in our partners, Cadal, Chatham House, and of course, our sibling organization in Germany, the Bertelsmann Stiftung. And we remind you that this is part of an ongoing series of regional webinars organized around the Bertelsmann Transformation Index, one of the Bertelsmann Stiftung's signature projects. We've got two good things for you today. Uh, we have a really important topic, Latin America, and we have a really strong panel. So that should make for an entertaining hour. Uh, and of course, I wanna remind you that we are live. So if you have any questions for the panel over the course of the presentation, be sure to type those in the Q&A section below, and I'll make sure to address them to our speakers. But before we get to our presentation, uh, I'd like to pass our proverbial microphone to Dr. Halka Hartman, who is a cornerstone of the BTI project. And I should add a scholar who is passionate about Latin America and has followed the region from a professional and academic standpoint uh, for a number of years now. So Halka, please. Thank you very much, dear Sam. I have the privilege to introduce you to this um, transatlantic dialogue, a transatlantic dialogue playing out in London, Buenos Aires, Santiago de Chile, Washington DC, and of course, Heidelberg, Gütersloh, Hamburg. Um, so um, 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 this transatlantic dialogue on political and social developments in Latin America, um, I would like to um, introduce to you the panelists and would like to introduce you briefly to the topic as co-director and coordinator of the Bertelsmann Stiftung's Transformation Index. And it is a special pleasure for us because we have always regarded the BTI not just as a number crunching uh, instrument for international comparison and assessment, uh, but also as an invitation for international dialogue. And the BTI is in itself a truly international undertaking, as we are proud and privileged to operate in a network of 300 country and regional experts from more than 120 countries. Um, so whenever our 5,000 pages of country reports come out, the readers can be sure that they carry the voices, the perspectives, and the assessments um, of uh, country experts from the very countries. So it's not talking about, but it is talking with. It is always uh, our goal to achieve an open dialogue. So um, um, our regional coordinator, Peter Thierry, um, is responsible for 22 of uh, these uh, country reports that we are publishing. Uh, but he's much more than just our regional coordinator. He also was the mastermind, one of the masterminds behind the conceptualization of the um, uh, transformation index. And he is based at Heidelberg University. And I do thank you very much, dear Peter, for introducing us to the results of the BTI 2020 in just a short while. As I stress the importance of and the potential of international dialogue, um, I should also mention that we are truly blessed to have a brilliant Argentinian cooperation partner, the Centro para la Apertura y el Desarrollo de la América Latina, Cadal in Buenos Aires, for so many years now. Uh, this is the fourth time that Cadal uh, not only translated major parts of the BTI into Spanish, and in fact, this webinar uh, coincides um, uh, with the publication of the fourth Spanish edition this July. Um, this opens up a whole new horizon of possibilities for regional outreach for us, uh, but also we are proud and happy that Cadal is producing own analyses and deductions by using BTI data and country reports. And from the many great people working there, please allow me to single out Gabriel Savia as director of Cadal, who initiated this cooperation and who is the very personification for me of international democratic cooperation. I know you're out there somewhere, Gabriel. Thank you so much. Um, Chris Sabatini and I, we serve with pleasure on Cadal's advisory board. And um, 
Um, and we see Qatar not just as a think tank, but also as an activist network with the clear goals of, of promoting democracy and human rights. And in this spirit of international democratic alliance, we would like to discuss today the political and social polarization in Latin America, solution oriented, sympathetic and in solidarity. Um, I met Chris first when uh, he was Senior Director of Policy at the Americas Society and Council of the Americas. Uh, but today, of course, we are privileged to have you with us here as Senior Research Fellow for Latin America at Chatham House. So one of the most respected European think tanks decides to put a special focus today on Latin American affairs. And this is really illustrating the growing importance of inter-regional dialogue for a thing like that to happen and you to help the whole enterprise. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here. And thanks to Kadal and thanks to Chatham House for co-hosting this event together with BFNA and Bertelsmann Stiftung. Now, what is missing in this lineup, of course, um, is a genuine Latin American perspective. And with Viviana Giacomon, you're not just getting any perspective, you are getting a multi-sectoral perspective. Uh, you are getting one that is informed by civil society work with Participa in Chile 21, with your on the ground work with activists as a regional director uh, for Freedom House in more than 15 countries, uh, your four year government experience working for La Moneda. And today, of course, you're shouldering the important task of coordinating and synchronizing manifold activities of the United Nations in uh, Chile in order to achieve sustainable development. Um, so Vivian, I believe it or not, uh, go back to 2003 when we first met in our Transformation Thinkers Forum and it is so wonderful to have you back again here today. Thank you. One quick word about the results of the BTI 2020 and how they relate to Latin America and it's going to be quick, I promise. Um, the results of the BTI 2020 are sobering. The past decade was marked by a significant erosion of participation rights and rule of law, um, a very volatile economic development and a persistently high level of social inequality, widespread bad governance as illustrated by rampant corruption and clientelism. And most of these very problematic developments on a global scale very much apply also to Latin America today. Um, why is that important for a transatlantic dialogue? Because Latin America, North America, and Europe um, are simultaneously facing democratic erosion on the one hand, uh, but basically with all inconsistencies, irritations, disagreements, disappointments, um, Latin America, North America, and Europe are sisters in mind. Uh, they share the same democratic and emancipatory values. And in challenging times like these, it is all the more important that we must join forces. And it is on this note that I'm particularly looking forward to our discussion today. We are privileged to have BFNA's regional specialist on Latin America, St. George, as our moderator today. And with your background, dear Sam, you will guide us expertly and competently through our discussion. So, Thank you very much for hosting this event and please do take it from here. Thank you so much, Hawke. Um, so I just want to very briefly frame our conversation this morning and to apologize in advance for sharing an old saying that I know many of us are tired of hearing. It's almost become a cliche, certainly to people in the region. It was first posited about Brazil and that was it was the country of the future and would continue to be so. And pardon that cliche, but the reason I bring that up is that it seems like just yesterday, but it was actually a number of years, a decade ago now, when Latin America appeared to be entering a new era full of tremendous opportunity and advancement, transition, as uh, the BTI noted. The commodity super cycle meant the region's governments, which faced a series of debt crises in the 80s and 90s, were suddenly very well financed. Elections, though flawed, had improved markedly and countries from Mexico to Argentina took important steps towards consolidating their democracies. Of course, under the stewardship of President Lula, Brazil saw tens of millions of families transition from poverty to a middle class. In Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, we saw strong growth, monetary and fiscal stability, as well as global and regional integration. And around the world, there was the feeling that for Latin America, the future had arrived. 
Now here we are five, 10, maybe 15 years later in some case. And I think it's to say, well, that there's been definitive improvements in health, safety, and that growing middle class. Many in the region are once again hoping for a better tomorrow. Um, given the political and economic complications underscored in this year's BTI report, many in that new middle class face a dangerous prospect of backsliding. And that's of course further uh, complicated by the current coronavirus crisis. So with that very brief framing, I would like to bring in our panelists. And the way this is gonna work is each of our esteemed panelists will offer a short introductory presentation. Uh, after that, we will do our own Bertelsmann transformation to the question and answer portion of this event. Um, I'd like to first start by bringing in uh, Dr. Thierry because I believe his presentation is gonna help us understand how we got to this point. So Dr. Thierry, the floor is yours. Yes, Anne, thank you very much and uh, hello to all. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of the results of our transformation index. So uh, I prepared a presentation. Could you bring it on, Sam? I can. Yeah. I can and I will. I uh, know you can. There I can. Okay. I yes, have you found can. it now. Has that worked correctly? Okay. I will make uh, three points. Um, first, a brief overview of on developments throughout the decade. Second, challenges for consensus building. And third, um, I draw an outlook um, in Corona times. Next, please. Yes, okay. Uh, my overview on developments is uh, only on uh, political transformation uh, for time reasons simply. Um, we see first, and this will not come as a surprise, uh, that democracy in Latin America is stagnating, if not receding. Since 2010, uh, we see a slight but a steady decline. How may we interpret this? And next, please. So, uh, a look at the data shows that the number uh, of autocracies has doubled from three to six in the decade after first Nicaragua, and then in the latest edition, Guatemala and Honduras were classified as autocracies. However, a look at the remaining 15 democracies, I leave here out Trinidad and Tobago, um, which is, has been new in BTI 2020. Uh, a look at uh, these 15 democracies show that there's also a certain resilience The figure here shows the average values for the aggregate score as well as for the relevant components of our democracy measurement. And they show that on average, there are no significant changes. That means there's a certain stability. Um, and of course, uh, what I always repeat, um, the weakest component remains uh, the rule of law. However, the figure also hides the fact that opposition, uh, that opposing developments balance each other. That is, positive changes are offset by negative ones, but particularly striking in the case of Mexico. Those oscillations, however, are typical uh, of the effective democracies. Um, and therefore, I will conclude with a few exceptions. It's a rather stagnant development, which is additionally uh, clouded by um, uh, the regressions I mentioned. Next, please. Okay, challenges for consensus building. I've chosen uh, this issue because it points to a neuralgic point in the development of democracy. For, in principle, uh, there must be a basic consensus among the citizens 
as well as within organized society. That means ultimately everyone, even the fiercest opponents, belong to the demos. And that an understanding among them is possible. So turning to the facts, I made a rough picture of polarization in Latin America. It is not based on objective data, let's say, but a mere estimation by myself of recent developments. Of course, you might object this classification, but overall, I think that is not too far from reality. Oof. I have a black screen. Uh, Peter, are you unable to see the presentation at this point? I have a black screen. Hmm. I do not see anything. Well, uh, Wait, do, do you uh, see the presentation? Hawk, are you seeing? We believe to see uh, the continued presentation and we're looking at a slide number two, challenges for consensus building. And there's a picture of polarization. Yes, we have a picture of uh, a graph of the approval of democracy, which notes a decline of social capital, which notes a similar decline. And okay, that's the next slide. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, we may continue. I don't say anything, but you hear me. We hear you fine. We continue. We're on uh, a chart entitled Outlook, Corona Times and Beyond. Or not a chart, a slide. Okay, let's turn uh, briefly to the polarization. That slide, well, I don't see it, but I, I will simply continue. Um, it's very simple that polarization implies uh, that diminishing social cohesion and trust complicate democratic consensus building. So next slide, that should be the approval of democracy, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, the approval of democracy <clears throat> is at an all-time low, uh, as also the latest Latino barometer uh, has demonstrated. And that means uh, that citizens' confidence in the problem-solving capacities of democratic institutions has declined while authoritarian, authoritarian alternatives are gaining ground. This distrust also intends to individual political institutions from the judiciary to parliaments and political parties. And the latter is also reflected in significantly lower values for the party systems. That means that the intermediation and aggregation of interests does not function sufficiently and thus the channels between society uh, and politics are eroding. Concerning social capital, very briefly, this also remains weak while the self-organization of societies is functioning reasonably well Trust between citizens is weak, and in cases such as Brazil, for example, it has fallen even further from an already low level. The second point is religious dogmas. Our indicator, which is named non-interference of religious dogmas, is together with democratic approval and party systems, the one that has suffered the greatest losses in the past decade. What does that mean? While the role of the Catholic Church has decreased somewhat overall, it is still very strong in some countries. On the other hand, and that's a major point, the evangelical churches have gained more influence, spreading in different spheres of society and politics up to political parties. According to the BTI country reports, this concerns almost all countries in Latin America. While some emphasize the positive role of these churches, for example, in the area of welfare, I consider them to be a threat to state and democracy in the longer term. This is uh, due to the fact that uh, these churches in general spread a strongly religious conservative ideology, which is sometimes presented with radical vigor. Both of the ranges are normal, they have the potential to divide societies, uh, as for example in Brazil or in the recent presidential elections uh, in Costa Rica. Do you still hear me? We do. Wonderful. 
Okay, at the core, uh, these positions uh, seem to be intransigent and ultimately anti pluralistic, although they find fertile ground in parts of the population. An issue which has been prominent was the fight against the so called gender ideology, which shows um, this potential uh, for social division. Uh, last slide. Okay, outlook. What does it mean for the prospects in and after Corona time? First, at present, uh, the pandemic is still spreading rapidly. Um, and statements on this must therefore remain somewhat provisional. Nonetheless, the pandemic uh, lays bare or even exacerbates existing weaknesses. For example, the concentration of power in the executive, which is sometimes abused, increasing debt burden, poverty and inequality, exclusion, and so on. Second, however, this critical juncture uh, might also present a window of opportunity for a paradigm shift as uh, we see in, in several discussions, at least in Europe already. Focal points, uh, make it very brief, should or might be what are essential state functions inside a functioning state, of course. New channels of participation, which might also compensate uh, for party systems weaknesses. The issue, a big issue of cooperation, either domestic, regional, or international, which, well, an issue which uh, had been prominent 50 years ago, but then in Cold War times, perhaps we have now a new opportunity. And solidarity, well, a big word, I know, um, but meaning uh, social cohesion can be constructed, but not invented from zero. Last point, of course, each country has its own peculiarities. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for that presentation. And I commend you uh, on working through the technical difficulties. I think a lot of us have had that experience over the last couple of months and it's not easy, but you did a great job. I, I, I gather giving that presentation having lost your slides. So thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to transition uh, to Ms. Viviana Giacoman, who has had a front row seat to uh, a number of the things that we're talking about today. So I'm very much looking forward to what she has to say. Thank you, Samuel. Um, and thank you everyone, uh, especially the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conversation. I think this is a very, very important topic and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to exchange ideas on this. Um, so in this presentation, I want to make three points. Um, I'm going to first say that the social contract in Latin America has simply failed um, to provide the minimum um, well-being for the population and that we need to create a new one, if that was a question for anybody. Um, second, that this is an urgent task. Um, the fact that um, we saw these waves of pop protests and discontent last year in the region speak to a very deep dissatisfaction with this current social contract. And the pandemic has made that very evident. Um, it will also likely increase these demands for change. And the third point I wanna make is that um, a new social contract should address how we relate to each other or the issue of social cohesion that Peter briefly mentioned. We typically understand social contract as a pact between citizens and the state, but we should also address how we relate to each other in order to avoid um, in that the increasing diversity and complexity of our societies end up having a greater fragmentation and problems for democracy. So my first point, um, I would say that the social contract has failed because first for a social contract to be uh, viable and strong, um, the deal must benefit citizens. And as we will see, it has not in Latin America. Um, second, uh, the citizens must trust that the state will comply their side of the bargain, um, which will grant legitimacy and trust to the institutions. And as Peter just showed us, uh, institutional trust is very low. Um, and third, citizens uh, must perceive that this deal is fair. And inequality in Latin America is such that it is the perfect expression of how unfair the system is. 
Um, so let's go uh, to the first idea that the, the deal has not benefited citizens. In, in, in fact, in the past years, Latin American countries have shown the inc an increased incapacity to deliver on public services, education, housing, um, health. Um, they have not created social protections, have remained incapable of de dealing with organized crime, crime or address corruption, um, have taken very timid or no steps to reduce uh, or mitigate climate crisis, which has affected livelihoods of the very poor the most, and along, et cetera. What happened? Um, in the past 15 years, there have been an expansion of, of middle class in the region, I would say from uh, 25 to roughly 40%. And that, what we could consider is a success story, is actually uh, made things worse. Um, because this new middle class, has experienced such levels of vulnerability that um, it just stays fe fearing to fall back into poverty due to any event, including unemployment, illness, lack of income. And the pandemic has actually proven those fears to be justified. That's exactly what's happening. Um, ACLAC actually uh, is telling us in their projections that um, uh, the poverty rates will be 34% reach 34% of the population of Latin America this year. Um, that means 28 million people will go back to poverty. Um, and extreme poverty will be around 13%. Um, that, of course, is in the context of what uh, the World Bank called the worst economic recession in history. And we're looking at figures of around 7% of contraction of the economy. So clearly nobody, no government could have anticipated a scenario like this, but countries were simply not prepared. Uh, suffice it to say that only eight countries of the region have unemployment insurance for former workers. Um, so this increased demand caused by the pandemic has uh, forced countries to respond and they have done so uh, very generously for the most part. But the expansion of social programs that we are seeing now will leave the states in a very weak position in the future. All right, second point, um, the social contract has failed to create trust. Um, in Latin America, we saw it in Peter's presentation, is very uh, distrustful. According to the Latino Barometro, only 14% of the population actually think that you can trust other people in Europe. In Northern European countries, that's about 60%, just to give you a comparison. Um, and the pandemic only reinforces those sentiments. The governments with low popular support before COVID have uh, shown greater difficulties to mobilize support around their health strategies. The official figures of people infected and death are uh, met with a skepticism, obviously, these days. Um, so this lack of trust provides the perfect environment for polarization and for the emergence of populist leaders that offer very easy solutions to complex that are, to problems that are complex. So finally, um, the social contract um, is needed, a new one, because the, the current one, it is unfair. And uh, it is unfair because we all know Latin America is very unequal um, uh, region, the second most unequal after uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. But here, I think that we need to go beyond income uh, and beyond averages to understand the real magnitude of the problem. So let's take gender inequality. Um, it is not only the pay gap that for the best paying jobs in Latin America are up. 30% between women and men. It is also the fact that last year, the average woman worked 25 hours more than men in a month. Now, the, the women in the audience today that are in the homes with the children under their care probably are doing the math and thinking that it's a little over 25 <laughs> extra hours that they're putting in. Um, so, but there are other inequalities, right? So the fact that poverty among indigenous populations is 26% higher than the other non-indigenous populations, that LGBTI communities have very limited care services. The labor conditions of migrant populations are completely different than nationals. So th there's a long list, but the message is only one. An unfair deal is a deal that people will not abide by. And this is the situation we have today. So let's look at the future. 
um, Peter said it and I Viviana, do we have you? So speaking of connectivity, speaking of connectivity problems, there you go. There you go. Am I back? You are back. Good. All right. So I was saying that we need to look at the future now. So there is a, a real opportunity here for a conversation about the future because going back to business as usual, as I just described, will be a bad idea. Um, in the words of the UN Secretary General. Um, it's, we have to recover better, we have to build back better. And actually, I would say that the silver lining of the pandemic is precisely that has opened this opportunity. We have to rethink the way we organize our economies, the way we consume, the way we work, the way we produce, um, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, the sustainable development goals have already been written. And not only that, they have been agreed by all countries. And they show a path of for building a sustainable, inclusive, fair development based on innovation with labor protections, rooted in a harmonious coexistence with the environment um, to build a resilient society with more livable cities. Um, and ultimately, um, we also have talked about a development model that um, is based on fair representation, more participation, stronger rule of law, greater respect for the rights of all. We just have to figure out how to get there. So let me conclude uh, with a final note on social cohesion. I would only have time to scratch the surface on this, but I just wanted to put it on the table for the conversation. Um, as, as they grow, societies become more complex and diverse. Uh, but they can also become more fragmented. This is a problem Europe has had to deal with. The, certainly the United States is dealing with it with the um, racial inequality that is pretty much on the agenda today. Um, and Latin American countries are not far, far from that. And we are seeing this growing polarization, two thirds of the country according to what Peter just told us. Um, and the pandemic will only exacerbate this. Um, so social co cohesion is that sense of community and solidarity is a very intangible um, uh, value that exists in society that many consider is a condition for a successful economy and strong democracy. Um, what's interesting is that unlike what we used to think, uh, the way we relate to each other, the level of solidarity we have, our interpersonal trust, are not just a given characteristic of a society or a cultural driven. Of course, they exist in some cultures more than in other cultures, but, but as Peter said, these values can also be developed. So as we think about a new social contract, we should discuss how to create incentives to promote social relations based on trust with respect of diversity, incorporating solidarity in social policy design, participatory decision-making processes, for example, etc. So in conclusion of our current social contract is weak and, inf and insufficient to address the demands of society, present and future. The wave of discontent we saw in the region last year was triggered by many different regions, including the demands for political freedoms or even a 30 cent increase in the fare of the, in the, in the metro fare. Um, but they were all manifestations of growing discontent. And in some cases, they explicitly question the, the current social contract. The pandemic has turned those existing problems into urgent needs. But also, it has opened a unique opportunity to step back, reconvene, like we're doing today, discuss and agree on a new path toward a more sustainable and inclusive development and a stronger democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana, for that powerful and uh, sobering presentation. Folks, I see we do have some questions coming in. Um, so we're not ignoring those. We're just going to hold those for the panel portion. Ruth, thank you for your question. Ezekiel, we see you as well. Other folks, you may have some questions. Now's a good time to start putting them in that Q&A function below. But before we get to that uh, part of the event, I want to bring in uh, Mr. Chris Sabatini, who is, you know, a, a bit for a long time, been a critical and really important voice on Latin America, somebody that I certainly from a, pro a professional level grew up reading. Uh, so it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Mr. Sabatini. Well, thank you, Sam. I assume you read my children's books when you're was, it's, uh, <laughs> about the right age. I have the honor and the challenge of batting cleanup here. 
uh, which is, I say, uh, an honor because uh, all of you, I know your work before, um, but also a challenge because I want to echo a lot of the things you've said without sounding like I'm, I'm plagiarizing them. Uh, let me say, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Hauke, for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to reconnect virtually. I met Hauke when um, the BTI was first starting, and I, at the time, had developed uh, the Social Inclusion Index, which did many of the things that uh, BTI did, but in, in a less ambitious way, um, looking at everything uh, from uh, access to education, economic opportunity, um, healthcare, to segregated by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, and also included a component of uh, LGBT rights. Uh, at the time, and I'm looking, and I looked down the list of your current uh, uh, rankings, uh, we, we also tracked pretty much with BTI uh, um, findings. So either we were both wrong or we were both right. I think it's the latter. And I think uh, the, the events of the last couple years have demonstrated uh, that these things truly matter in terms of not just uh, political stability and the protection of those rights, but to maintaining the very element of social fabric uh, that is necessary to sustain democracy and even economic development. So I'm gonna talk about three things here. The first is a little bit of a, a complaint or a gripe, if you will, is the problems of measurement that, that Hauke and I were talking about way back, I don't wanna go back how long, it was probably when Sam was reading my children's books. Um, the, uh, um, but years ago, we were talking about the problems of the way the international community has measured development, uh, political development, uh, that I think the BTI effectively uh, 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 challenges in a good way, uh, but it hasn't been incorporated sufficiently into uh, standard measures of development. Uh, the second is I'll talk about uh, the problems of structural uh, disintegration of societies uh, and state capacity. Uh, in the ways that both Peter and Viviana have mentioned. And then last, I'll try to talk, I'll try to end on a more, if you will, uh, optimistic note, is how do you restitch together uh, the social fabric? So let's start with measurement problems. The first thing that, that Hauke and I noticed years ago uh, in talking was the, the almost uh, intoxication, if you will, over the rise of the middle class. Um, this idea that globally, the global South had, had elevated a middle class. In Latin America alone, there were supposedly 50 million people that joined the middle class. The problem is, is when you scratch the surface of that, you found out that actually the way the World Bank was measuring the middle class was only income per capita of $10 a day. That's it. Didn't matter how you got that $10 a day. You could have a formal job in a factory with benefits, or you could be selling loose cigarettes on the streets uh, at, a, at a stoplight. Um, it didn't matter. And that was fundamentally wrong. And when we challenged the World Bank on this, they said, well, we've, we've done the tests and those who are less likely to fall back into poverty are those who are earning more than $10 a day. They later revised this to $12 a day, acting as if this had somehow solved the problem. It didn't. The problem is, is this is a very dumbed down version of what constitutes the middle class. When we think middle class, and I say this coming from a developed country, we assume that it involves a stable floor of social benefits, healthcare, unemployment insurance. Peter, you talked about the lack of unemployment insurance um, or that only 8% of, of employees in Latin America have access to unemployment insurance. That is the middle class. It's not just how much you earn a day. And we're about to see the implications of not having that definition of the middle class right now under COVID-19. The second issue that has to do with this is sort of the static notions of inequality. It was kind of sad the way the world was left scratching its head uh, in the wake of the protests in Chile when everyone said, well, Chile is the most, un is the most equal uh, country in the region. How, how, could, how could this happen? And there's a conundrum. Well, the truth is, is we, anyone who knew could have seen this brewing for a long time. I'll, I'll defer to Viviana, who's clearly on the ground and has experienced this, but it wasn't inequality in any sort of static sense. It was a lack of social mobility, the lack of economic opportunity and social opportunity over time. Yes, you could earn more money, but could your children go to a necessarily a better school? Could you, could you gain access to better healthcare? And that was completely missed in the discussion on um, uh, um, Latin America and social and economic growth. So enough complaining. Um, I think all this is to say that I think we need to do better. And I think that BTI starts to do that, that we need to incorporate measures of both political efficacy in terms of the ability of politics to deliver representation state efficacy 
for a state to deliver social policies, but also the effectiveness of the market. And what I like about the BTI index, and I'm not just here to sell it, because um, I receive no profits from it, nor is it actually for sale, by the way, um, is that it, um, it captures the, it's pro-market. I mean, the, the idea of the economic transformation is injecting market incentives into an economy, but it's very social democratic in its orientation of that, those measures. And that's very important and we've lost that, which gets me to the second point I'm gonna talk about, which is the, the notion of sort of structural changes that Peter's talked about and Viviana have talked about. Um, what we're seeing in Latin America right now was evident again before, but was oftentimes ignored. And it's now basically the collision of labor and social services in the, from the leftover from the neoliberal, neoliberal era of globalization with the crisis in COVID-19. More than 60% of Latin America's population, working class population exists in the informal sector. That's the informal sector that not only do they just work off the books, they also don't have access to unemployment insurance or oftentimes they depend on severely deficient public healthcare services or public services that we're seeing now have created a very bifurcated situation in these societies of people who have access to private healthcare, private education, or in those who have public access to very underfunded, inefficient public healthcare and public education. Um, we're, we're seeing this now and you cannot build a social contract or rebuild the social fabric when those severe deficiencies exist. And that's exactly, and, and you know, this is, if, when you look at the rates, and, and the truth is, is this is not just the rates of formal employment. Um, it also has to do with sort of formal economic uh, activity, the large numbers of informal businesses that are active. And here the blame is not entirely just business. The blame is also in part of, in the part of unions who for so long worked to defend collective bargaining rights of those who are already unionized. But you look in places like Peru or uh, um, Colombia, where you know, six to eight to 10% at most of workers are unionized. Unions have not done the hard work of trying to organize a very heterogeneous and fractured uh, labor market in the last couple decades. And you cannot build, again, that social contract unless you have those, those elements. At the same time, we've seen the collapse, as Peter mentioned, of party systems, that fundamental cleavage, the really defined party systems of between Christian Democrats and social Democrats, of between uh, Republicans in the, in the, in the um, uh, if you will, sort of European sense and more liberals in the uh, European sense. That, has, that, that is fundamentally different uh, today because you simply don't have those, those fundamental cleavages. And in their wake, have risen all those fractured identities and political movements that Peter and Hauke talked about, whether it's evangelicals or more rights-based groups, everything from, and all legitimate in terms of the representation of people's interests, but not easily aggregated into both uh, um, actionable policy prescriptions, as well as ways that orient citizens and provide uh, a sense of community. When we think about, if we look at the literature on community and social contracts, it depends on several things. One is a sense of shared destiny. One is a sense of shared identity. Um, and the other is a sense of, of trust in, uh, among each other and trust in the state. And all of those today are fundamentally at risk. Um, and again, COVID-19 has shed real, true light, a very harsh light on these pre-existing structural fissures and complications that we're only beginning to realize now. So let me shift to the last point, the reasons for optimism. First of all, it's difficult to imagine uh, how the social contract can be constructed. I think Viviana's suggestions are fundamental. Providing social services in ways that are participatory, that build a sense of community and shared uh, uh, destiny in terms of how people divide up resources and share them and, and not sort of every person for their own. Because the truth is, is we don't have a roadmap for this. There is no precedent for how to rebuild a social contract. The closest thing I think of was Robert Putnam's Making Democracy Work and talked about Northern and Southern Italy. And in that case, he goes all the way back to the Roman times to describe what created social capital. We don't have that long. Uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we, have to go, we have to start now. And I think part of this depends on first of all, reimagining and promoting how we identify uh, uh, the, the notions of political and economic development and integration. 
recreating and recrafting social programs in ways that um, begin to build the sort of community and share destiny that Viviana talked about and being able to create and improve state efficiency. Social trust depends on people cooperating. It also depends on a certain faith that the state is going to respond in a way that is just, in a way that is equal, without regard to gender, race, sexual orientation, and we've lost that. Um, I think we can begin to recraft this, I think, post-COVID. All the lessons we're learning now that we probably knew about before, but are coming into very sharp relief, that momentum needs to be maintained. Uh, and I hope that it will be. Um, and I'll leave it there for questions uh, and for other comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, just a couple notes I want to say. First of all, that Putnam book, that North South Italy book is really a, a great, a great book. Definitely recommend, check that one out. I was, I was happy to hear you mention that. I'm packing up my apartment to move uh, to London full time. And I'll admit that's one of the books I'm keeping. <laughs> that's a good one. It's a it's good, good one. one. Um, BTI project. It's available online. BTI-project.org. Uh, you could also just search Bertelsmann Transformation Index. It'll come up first. It's got all the information uh, from the book, from the results on Latin America that we're discussing today, as well as the rest of the world. So definitely check that out. Highly recommend it. Uh, we have about a quarter hour left for questions. And I had a couple questions, but I'm going to skip those for now because we actually have some really good ones coming in from the audience. Um, I want to start with this one from Ruth. Um, and I, I guess it's directed towards Peter, but it's a really good question. And what's, what do you see as behind this kind of growth of the evangelical church in Latin America? And then it's also, according to the question, gaining uh, political power what, what do you see as the long-term impact of that and what's driving that? And you're on mute. There you go. Well, uh, good question, yes. Uh, well, 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 what, what is behind? Um, well, so pull and push factors, of course, for it's not a new history of the evangelical churches in Latin America. It started 30 or 40 years ago. So uh, on the one hand, there, well, there's a missionary appeal, let, let, let's say, of the evangelicals, of course. And on the other hand, there are spaces uh, in Latin America where either the state uh, or the Catholic church lost ground. And so they could uh, spread uh, in these spaces. And um, perhaps their growth in the recent years or their growing strength um, is surely related again to state weaknesses. Is perhaps also related to the weakness of the left. Because, and I mentioned it, um, that around uh, these churches, it's not only a spiritual thing, it's welfare program. It's, um, they, if they do not provide for jobs, uh, they can mediate so uh, that people get into a job. So it's a, a social network. And it's not a centralized church. Uh, they are, it's a more decentralized, and so they can easily adapt to, to any situation. And that's uh, what makes them attractive. Well, and in the long term, uh, perhaps not so in the long, perhaps in the middle term, um, I think uh, if the tendencies will continue, then uh, they, well, as they, um, notice that they can de develop political power, that they can enter parties or create parties, I think that they will decisively or want decisively to play a political role. And that will in the end lead to a new strong conservatism in Latin America. Thank you very much, Peter. We got a question from Azito. Could I add, answer Absolutely. Jump on a very good question please, please. too? Um, two things. <clears throat> First of all, as, as, as Peter said, uh, um, you know, evangelical churches are providing a service that, that others haven't. First of all, the state, definitely, but also parties. When I mean, you think about European political parties, the ones that sort of basically cast the, the entire trajectory of democracies post-World War II, 
Now, these were parties that were defined by one political scientist, cradle to grave. They provided you benefits. They provided you a social forum. They provided you with your network and understanding and worldview. Um, they no longer do that because of reasons for obviously the collapse of socioeconomic structures and growth of other alternative media. Um, evangelical movements do. Um, and I do think that, that civil society groups have also failed to provide or fill that space. And I'll say that there's a quick thing and I'm treading on very thin ice here, I realize. I was at a meeting in Cadal actually in Buenos Aires and they were complaining about the pushback in Cuba by evangelical groups against marriage equality law. And the human rights group says, yeah, we're really sorry. The evangelicals are so good at building their network. They've, been, they've had soup kitchens for years that are feeding people. And I thought, why weren't the human rights groups doing this? Why, why, why weren't LGBT groups doing this? Um, you need to build brand. And I think in some ways, the, the evangelical groups have been far more effective at building a grassroots presence than current political parties and many civil society groups. Thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate you jumping in on that one. I was just uh, mentioning that we got a question from Mazita saying, what was the name of that James Putnam book? And that name is Making Democracy Work, Civic Traditions in Modern Italy, released in 1993. A lot of what he's talking about still makes sense in the North-South Italy dynamic. And the reason why it's nice for me to double back to that is because one of the things he really talks about in that book about Northern Italy is the importance of civic society. Something as simple as uh, choir groups, just having that kind of bond, a political civic society really is, is one of the things that uh, helped Northern Italy. And that leads into our question from Ezekiel, which I believe came in during Viviana's presentation. So I would direct it uh, to you. And the question is, as members of civil society organizations, how can we push governments to build back better, especially in a time of increased concentration and abuse of power, which undermine institutions? Boy, that's an important question for Latin America, but really for a lot of places in the world right now. It is indeed. And I'm not sure if I have the uh, right answer because there are possibly many, but I would say that um, civil society should continue to do what it does well, which is monitor, report, raise the hand, point out of the problems, right? But in addition, I think it's very important to broaden the networks of the discussion. Sometimes we're encapsulated, or civil society is encapsulated in itself, and so the reach is very limited. And I'm thinking here about the private sector. That is a voice that governments hear. And we tend to have two separate conversations about the same topic at the same time in different rooms in, of the same city. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to change to the extent that uh, put pressure on, on um, private sector. I think this is the moment where companies have to think about what is their role in society? What is there going to be their contribution to sustainable development? How do they want to engage for a different kind of uh, ways of pro 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 production and um, distribution and et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that that's, that's very important. And then what I mentioned, right? So uh, participatory decision-making um, processes, uh, we need to continue to push for those uh, to the extent that civil society is included in the design of the solutions, then uh, it will be, of course, the outcomes will be better. Thank you so much. Uh, I, it's, an, it's a critical question and I think that's, you say there may be many answers. I think that's a very good one. Uh, we have a very, very important question coming in from Jairo Acuna. Uh, and it's about the consequences of COVID-19, which is hitting parts of the region where they face chronic underinvestment in, in public health. And the way that's played into by political ideologies and the role of the state uh, in a public health uh, epidemic. And I think this is a real good time to bring Dr. Hartman back into the conversation. Hawka, maybe you would like to take a crack at this one? I think there are, first of all, it's great that you're, that you're with us, Jairo. It uh, was wonderful to see your name here. Another transformation thinker joining in. Um, and uh, um, Jairo, you addressed a bundle of things. And I think the ones that are um, addressed to the health system and the exclusion in the health system and how um, uh, is dealt with, with uh, COVID-19, I think I leave it to the other more experienced speakers. But the one thing that I really would like to pick up is the one that you said, what if the socioeconomic exclusion 
is not just happening, but is orchestrated. Um, and that I think is a very important question because as we are thinking about how to redesign, how to um, initiate initiatives of bringing society back together, we should also bear in mind that this is an orchestrated and well-planned undertaking also to drive societies apart. And when we are looking at the results of the BTI 2020, one of the headings that we are having is um, unfree, unfair, on the political sphere and on the economic sphere. Um, thanks very much, uh, Chris, for relating to the BTI as a quintessentially social democratic or at least one that is pro-market but also pro-social inclusion. Um, there are a lot of very conscious efforts for undermining exactly that. Uh, so what if, I would like to continue the question that Jairo just raised, what if rules are well-defined but are not necessarily well played. Uh, there is a lot of protection of private property, a lot of competition policy, a lot of um, um, basics of market economic frameworks, but they do not play out. And they do not play out to the detriment um, of those that are underprivileged, uh, of those that are excluded. Um, there is this very strange divide that uh, pro-market stands would necessarily mean that it would also be a socially cold um, uh, whatever stance. Um, I would argue the opposite is the case if you're defining market rules well, and if you bring in people that want to build up their own small shop, uh, and if you bring in um, uh, people, um, uh, if you compensate uh, for, the, um, for the weaknesses that are created by a capitalist system. Um, and so the political exclusion and the social exclusion and the economic exclusion, they are happening simultaneously. And this is not happenstance, but this is a power play. So any civil society move or any opposition move, any reform move must be very aware that this is power politics that need to play out well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Halka. We're getting a lot of questions. I'm looking at one from Martina. We also have one from Rafael Castro. People talking about, um, well, in the case of Martina, she starts by asking, are we seeing different approaches to the COVID-19 crisis response and are some working better than others? But then she goes on to ask, are there organizations that we can look to to help push for sustainable, fair, inclusive development, I suppose, in, in the health direction? And I guess Rafael Castro's question is along a similar line. What is the role of some civil society organizations in pushing for that new contract? So there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about what can civil so society do to help push these numbers that we note are down back in the right direction. Uh, Viviana, I, I invite you to start, but that's, that's an open question for the panel. I find it very interesting that the question is about how to take action, right? I mean, if that's the case, if we leave the room or these rooms with that message, then I would feel very happy um, because this is the, the, actually the time to do that. Um, I, I think that the, the, it's not only who, what organizations, we don't have to get super creative. As I said, in 2015, all countries of the world signed the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda. That's a roadmap, very detailed, comprehensive of how uh, to uh, have a better society in all senses, with the environment, with, with the economy, with society, with democracy. Um, so what we need to do is hold, people, hold the governments accountable and help them be partners and make sure that in the conversation um, we are the di diverse views and perspectives are on the table. So, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, start with no, that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can... Uh, unless anybody else wants to jump in, um, I would say we're getting close to running out of time here. This has been a wonderful Can I, can I add one thing, Please, Sam? absolutely. Uh, come on in. Add to Hauke's question or comment uh, and tie it into Viviana's country. Um, the, um, I, you know, in, in Latin America under colonial times, uh, when the, the crown um, would, from Spain, um, would pass all these rules and the, the saying was among the locals, the Creole elite in Latin America, obedezco pero no cumplo. I obey but I don't comply. <laughs> to say, you know, yeah, 
well, yeah, sure, King. We just aren't going to actually implement the law. Um, that's obviously still the case. And I worry uh, that, for example, in Chile, that the move to rewrite the Constitution, potentially, the plebiscite, the referendum on the Constitution rewrite that was postponed, um, is seen as a palliative. And constitutions are important, we know that, but they're not certainly not a panacea in terms of, of addressing a lot of these issues. Uh, and you, yes, you need to rewrite election laws so that people are better represented in the famously closed uh, system that is Chile. But you cannot pin too many hopes that will lead to effective implementation of those rights and rules that are implied or explicit in that constitution unless elites and the state are held accountable for what is contained in them. And you think of the flip side of Brazil, where the constitution is like, you know, it, it is like, uh, you know, uh, uh, things, were, you know, remembrance of things past by Proust. It's, it's, you know, a tome. No one can read it. No one can implement it. You hope that what results is an understanding of the fusion between obligations of the governed to uh, the obligations of those who govern to comply with those laws. I would just say, and it's a, so it's a fair point. It's, it's about rules being respected and implemented, but the pressure from below that makes that happen. Thank you. Um, you know, as we near the end of our time this morning, I'd like to just take one more trip around our panel um, and invite everybody to suggest one concrete step forward that you think would benefit the region. What is, we, we, we always like to end on a kind of optimistic note. What is something that we, that people in Latin America and around the world can do right now or to work on right now that could help get in the right direction? Uh, we can start, Chris, I guess, since, since we just left with you, we can start with you. Uh, I was hoping I'd have some more time to think about that. <laughs> Sorry, Thanks, I know that happens. <laughs> that happens all the time to me. It's like, go left, go left, and it goes right. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I, I think, the, the, the problems we're identifying in Latin America are not unique to Latin America. Right. So, Again, COVID-19 is exposed in, in, in the U.S. You know, there's a problem in formal sector workers, except here they're called euphemistically gig workers, the gig economy. Mm -hmm. They're the same thing. We need to build cross-regional alliances in the ways that there was, for example, to cite the German Stiftung, you know, the Adenauer Foundation and the Ebert Foundation, we need to build those sorts of cross-regional links of commonalities among populations to recast what we want of our societies. These are not unique, these are not problems that are unique to Chile or Argentina or Brazil. They're not even unique to Latin America. They, they are worldwide. And if I can end, you know, I think COVID perhaps may have helped us understand that, but I think we need to begin to form, and I think this, uh, Sort, these sorts of platforms are precisely important for doing that sort of thing, to build that common understanding and to build those common links and agenda in ways that help us break down sort of the, the idea that we're all struggling in this in a very compartmentalized way, because we're not. Thank you so much. And I think you make an excellent point about the gig economy. Uh, Peter, can I, can I get a final word from you? What would you like to see moving forward? Well, depends. Uh, first is to well to handle, let's say, the the, the Corona crisis. We know that in America, North and South America, it's still growing. Um, so we have to wait. Uh, how I, I I think I just read a comment from Liliana Deris from Argentina, my Argentina expert for PTI. Um, and she feels, uh, as, as I wrote, uh, that Latin America turns to authoritarianism. Well, at the moment, it's perhaps not the case, but uh, let's wait. What, what happens if uh, the pandemic uh, is more accurated? That's first. Second, uh, well, it's difficult from um, country to country. Yeah, uh, in Chile, you have already initiated a constitutional process, let's say. Um, so the situation in Chile is rather different from the situation in Venezuela. Yeah, so you, you have to pose very different questions. Um, in the case of Chile, <coughs> sorry, I 
would uh, recommend that the civil society, civil society actors uh, join and uh, also join with the political society, that is uh, the willing, the parties willing uh, uh, to reform. In other cases, that's really more difficult. And, um, but third point, if they are willing governments who recognize that they perhaps have to change a regional pattern of uh, development in Latin America, for one uh, country alone cannot do this. Yeah? You must have an alliance, but that's perhaps uh, looking very far to the future. Thank you very much, Peter. Viviana, can you give us a, a final word, an optimistic outlook, some steps you'd like to see uh, going forward? Okay, let's do that. Um, I, would, I would do it timely and not very forward-looking. I would uh, talk about what's happening now. We're in the middle of a pandemic and ask uh, Chris talked about what we can do about tra transnational collaboration. Peter talked about uh, the situation in different countries. I'm going to even go further down and say, let's talk about people. Right, and today um, it, it, we are facing a situation where um, solidarity is, is tested, is being tested. And I spoke about social cohesion is an issue that to me it's uh, crucial really, and it's often overlooked and misunderstood. And so social cohesion, cohesion starts in very small things. And I would ask you, all of you, um, do you know how your neighbors are doing? right? With COVID. Are they doing okay? Do they need anything? Uh, do we know that? Do we have that practice? Um, in, in Latin America, trust me, I don't think that's the case. In other societies, it might be. So I think that a good place to start is simple. Uh, we're in a very uh, difficult situation and wearing a mask is an act of solidarity and respect for others. I, I am in shock when I see uh, the news of the United States and in other countries, people not wearing masks. Or, um, so I think that, that that's uh, something that we can do that is concrete, that is uh, real, tangible, that really helps. And if we do it in the sense that uh, we are helping build that sense of community, um, then the better. Thank you so much. I'm so heartened by how much of this conversation is focused on civil society because it's so crucial, certainly in Latin America, definitely here in the United States. Halka, can I get a last word from you? Yeah, really just one sentence. Um, I would, I would um, opt for or would suggest to uh, strengthen the integrity mechanisms even further because there is nothing as exclusionary as rampant corruption clientelism uh, there should be an end to the division between the formal stage where the shadow play takes place and the informal playing field um, on which the most important decisions are made but which is tilted so anti good anti-corruption policy would be a better anti-corruption policy would be a great start thank you hawker you know i want to say that you guys out there you've been an excellent audience i had a Big stack of questions and I didn't get to ask any of them because we had really, really good participation this morning. Um, I want to give one more thank you to our excellent panel, Halka, Chris, Peter, Viviana, to our partners, Kadal, Chatham House, uh, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, and of course here the Bertelsmann Foundation. I uh, want to apologize to some folks, we couldn't get to your question, uh, but we're all available uh, after this, you know, email us, reach out, BTI, is online and highly recommended. So we hope you check that out. And we want to remind you um, that this is an ongoing series. Hawkeye, I meant to have the date in front of me. When's the next presentation? It is on July 16. And the region? Uh, it is a round table on the five falling stars, Turkey, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Brazil. The ones we wanted to build a democratic multilateralism on. And with them together, we wanted to expand human rights and democracy. And now look what happened to these countries. We need to discuss the domestic developments and the international implications. Boy, that sounds like a good one. That sounds like a good one. So thank you very much. This conversation will subsequently be available online. We want to wish you a happy afternoon or evening. And we'll see you July 16th for the roundtable discussion on those five major countries. Goodbye, everybody.